Cerrito Valley Wildlife Sanctuary Open House 2020. Thank you all for joining us under these unusual circumstances. My name's Tiffany and I've been working here for the last two seasons. I started here as a supervisor last summer and I've come back again for this summer. I've already been able to learn so much revolving around wildlife and wildlife rehabilitation, which makes me extremely excited to take you on this virtual tour today. RVWS was founded in spring 2005 to fill a void in the community and to provide treatment and animal care to our local wildlife. We are licensed by the Ministry of Natural Resources and are a registered charitable organization. This building behind me was built in 2008 with the aid of public donations as well as 1,500 hours of volunteer labor to construct the rehab rooms in half the building. It took another three years to complete the other half of the building and over the years we've admitted over 10,000 animals so far including this year having taken in over 800 already. There are currently 15 full-time interns working at the sanctuary as well as 15 weekly volunteers. What we do here would not be possible without their hard work and dedication that they bring to us every single day. Usually we have about 65 weekly volunteers but we did have to limit it due to the COVID safety measures unfortunately. Since we can't be together in person right now we're going to be doing a virtual open house of our facility so that you can get a bit of a behind the scenes look at how we care for the animals. Follow me. Most of the animals that we receive come from the general public who come across injured or orphaned wildlife. We have tips on our website to help the public determine what to do in common wildlife situations. And when someone thinks that they found an animal in need of care, they contact us and we walk them through the steps before they bring them in. This is where we usually admit animals now, um, but beforehand, like last year, we would have admitted them inside just at our front desk. But uh, because of COVID, no one's actually permitted to enter the building right now unless they are an intern or volunteer because our number one priority is keeping everyone safe, both ourselves, the animals, and the people bringing in the animals as well. When people arrive, they ring the doorbell and we collect their contact information um, as well as the animal and the information regarding that animal outside. Right when you enter the facility, we have the office as well as the kitchen. The office is where we do all of our administration, like communicating with the public, keeping records and paperwork, scheduling releases, and everything else that goes on behind the scenes to keep this facility running. In the kitchen, we keep all of the food and formula for the animals, as well as some of the dishes that we use every day. We want to make sure that each animal is getting everything that they would from their mom in the wild, so we have a special formula for each species. It costs approximately $18,000 per year because we import it from the U.S. and only use the highest quality formula. That amounts to about 60 buckets per year. We need that much formula because some of these hungry little babies receive up to seven formula feedings per day depending on their age. As they get older, the number of formula feedings they get per day drops from six to five to four, all the way until they are old enough to only eat solid food. Squirrels love fresh fruit and vegetables and especially love sunflower seeds and nuts while carnivores like raccoons and skunks start to receive dog food and cat kibble um, when they're about four to eight weeks old. We use upwards of 120 kilograms per day or five to 10 tons each year of dry cat and dog kibble. We also supplement diets with fruits and veggies and natural foods that they would find in their environment. Here is our raccoon nursery. Raccoons are very susceptible to many different types of diseases and so we use this room to isolate any raccoons that appear to be sick in order to avoid spreading that disease to uh, any of the healthy raccoons that we have here. There are lots of other quarantine measures that we use. Like my friend here Kylie is demonstrating. She has a isolation gown that we change in between each of our raccoon cages as well as gloves. She's also wearing a face shield so that nothing sprays on her face from the raccoons or any other animals that we have here. In here is the laundry room. This is where we keep all of our linens, blankets, towels, or anything that has been donated to us. And all of our extra supplies especially. In an average week we go through 48 rolls of paper towels, 40 boxes of tissues, and several gallons of disinfecting solution. So we're constantly restocking. And this is where we store all of them. We do about three to six loads of laundry every day of towels, blankets, face masks, and scrubs. And in an effort to save electricity, we dry all the clothes on a clothesline outside.
We're just going to be speaking outside each of the rooms today so we're not within earshot of any of the animals. Wildlife are not allowed to be on public display, so we need to make sure that we're limiting all of our human contact through sight, sound, and smell. This is why we have one-way viewing windows so that when the lights are off in the hallway and the lights are on in the room, uh, we can see into the animals but they cannot see out to us or get stressed by the sound of us. This right here is a squirrel room where we house squirrels and other small rodents including chipmunks and mice. Squirrels are formula fed until they're about 8 to 10 weeks old, then they go out into outdoor enclosures. We release them back into the wild when they're about 12 weeks old. Most spring babies are outdoors right now or have already been released so this room is pretty quiet at the moment. Babies that have been orphaned will often seek help from people by following them around or crawling up legs, which is something that they don't normally do as they're naturally afraid of humans. There are two main types of squirrels that we get in at the Wildlife Sanctuary, both the Eastern Grey Squirrel and the Red Squirrel. This is one of our Eastern Grey Squirrels. You can see that he's black in color and this is because Eastern Grey Squirrels come in three colors or phases, the black, grey and the honey brown. A single litter might have all three colors in it. Our squirrel room is organized based on priority. In the left corner, you can see that we have an incubator. What the incubator is, is basically a controlled environment where we place our vo most vulnerable animals, such as our neonates, because they can't regulate their own temperature. Therefore, this incubator keeps them warm while they're here with us. We keep our highest priority patients on this top shelf. This is so that we know who to tend to first throughout the day. Below this shelf, it goes in order of number of feeds, and as animals get bigger, they move into larger cages, which fit on the larger shelves on the right. My name is Kylie and this is my second summer working here. Last summer I was an intern and this summer I'm a ship leader. Um, my favorite animals to work with are the raccoons, so I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the raccoon rooms. This room over here is the main raccoon room, which we call Raccoon Juvie. This is our biggest rehab room and it houses our raccoon teenagers who receive three and under formula feedings per day. In this room we currently have 28 raccoons, so it's a full house. This raccoon here was heard crying inside the walls of someone's house. After a few days, the owners of the house were able to reach her. We then directed them on how to try and reunite her with her mom, but by that time it was unfortunately too late. This is when they brought the newly orphaned raccoon into us. I've been a supervisor here for two years. This is the turtle rehab room which is decked out with plum tanks that were specially built for us a few years ago by some amazing volunteers. Each tank has an area for swimming and a dry dock area with grass and a rock for sunning under heat and UV lamps. The most common turtle species that we get in are blending turtle, painted turtle and snapping turtles. However, there are eight turtles species in Ontario which are all species at risk. Almost all of the turtles that come in have been hit by cars as they cross the road to lay eggs or find a new habitat. Female turtles take from 8 to 25 years to reach maturity and begin laying eggs, so saving one, even one turtle's life is a true conservation effort. Some of the shell injuries we see are pretty brutal, but with the proper treatment and care, turtles can survive what seems even like the most horrific injuries. We also give them fluids for hydration, pain medication, and sometimes antibiotics depending on the extent of their injury. We have several methods for repairing shells, and since the shell is made of bone, it will eventually fuse together like humans when we break a bone. It can take several months to over a year for severe injuries to heal. For severe injuries that require surgery, we send turtles to the Turtle Trauma Centre in Peterborough, Ontario. Hi, my name is Eliza and I started working here in 2018 as an intern. My favorite animals are the skunks, which are in Lagoon, so I will talk about Lagoon today. So this is Lagoon. The reason why it's called Lagoon is because it used to be our turtle room and the name kind of just stuck. We currently house our skunks and groundhogs. 
We have 23 skunks currently, um, four of which are inside and then the rest are out. We have a litter of nine skunks who were orphaned and came in when they were eyes closed. Um, after seven weeks of treatment and care, all nine are big and are now in our outdoor enclosures. Um, skunk can release their musk at only 10 days old. And although at that age, it's more of a skunk whiff than a spray, it can get pretty stinky back here. Skunks are born with their eyes closed, but even once their eyes are open, they are mostly blind. So they rely a lot on their sense of smell and sound to get around. So we make sure that we talk quietly to them so that they can always know where we are and we don't spook them and get sprayed. We also have two baby porcupines that were in this room, but they've been since moved out into their outdoor enclosure. And we finally have two baby groundhogs. Right now, Kilgore and Miss Fatty, <laughs> both sadly orphaned from their moms. They came into us separately as small babies, but they were put together so that they can grow up with a buddy and be released together. This is the mammal room, which is a multi-purpose space that we use depending on what animals we have admitted. In the spring, three baby foxes had the run in the room, but they are now outdoors in a large grass enclosure. When the foxes were in here, we were able to limit human contact to keep them wild, while also monitoring them from the one-way viewing windows, as I mentioned previously. Currently, this room houses older raccoons who are just about ready to move to outdoor enclosures. As I mentioned before, the raccoons eat dog food along with their formula, so we go through a lot of dog food in the summer. We don't normally show this on the tour, but just to give you an idea, this is the dog food room. We receive donations of dog food from the public and from several pet stores across the city, which we are very thankful for. Another essential item that we use every day is newspaper. We line the bottom of all of our cages with a few pieces of newspaper, and it is cleaned every single day, multiple times throughout the day at each feeding. We graciously accept donations multiple times throughout the year and it equals to about a thousand stacks of newspaper per year. This concludes our virtual facility tour. Thank you so much for taking part in our 2020 virtual open house.